All right, welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, I think uh, we give it maybe like if, uh, one or two more minutes and to yeah. allow others to join. It's really nice to see so many of you on German time, like even before, uh, uh, before 9 a.m. PT. Uh, for now, I'm going to share a poll with you and that will give me a little bit of a better understanding of how much an intro I should give. So I launched a poll. You should be able to see it in your screen and it should be popping up. It has um, three questions. Uh, the first one is, is this your first foresight salon? Then where are you located? And how are you feeling? Mm. Um, great, I see the first people are responding. That's awesome. And I will attend to the waiting list and see who else we want to admit. Great. Um, all right. Oh my God, you have a lot of guests joining. Um, lovely. Um, I would love to know how many, okay, I have um, one person so far who voted. Um, the poll should be popping up by you uh, in one of your, uh, in, in the Zoom window, in the. Yeah, so Alison, I think it's difficult to, uh, I, can't, I can't, it doesn't change when I, oh, maybe it's changing. Uh, yes. Oh, it doesn't change. Oh, maybe, maybe might... there's a bit of a lag. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm trying. All right. To... Why don't we do it? Uh, we can do it a different way. That's uh, maybe even a more fun way. So, if the people who can uh, open up the video, uh, then we can do a little hand voting. Um, otherwise, you can vote with uh, a raise your hand with a feature. So. Um, Oh, we have two people. Okay, whose uh, who's, uh, first Foresight Salon is it? Please raise your hand or... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a few. Well. Yeah, we have a few. That's awesome. Okay, then uh, where are you located? Um, is anyone not located in North America? Please raise your hand or uh, tell us in the chat or clap. Where are you if you're not in... Uh, in North America. Feel free to use the chat for it. Let's see. Hello. All right. Um, and um, who, ah, oh, man. Uh, the other question that I asked is, how are you feeling? Very negative, negative, mediocre, positive, or very it. positive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I yeah, accidentally pressed them too, but. <laughs> well, actually, you'll be interested to know that most people in the poll uh, clicked on either negative or positive. So we have no very negative, we have no one in the middle, and we have no one at very positive. So let's see if we can move everyone uh, a little up uh, today. Okay, so I will still be admitting uh, more participants in the uh, mailing list and uh, in the waiting room, and we have quite a few waiting. Wow, this is great. Uh, especially a lot of familiar faces. Um, well done for many people in San Francisco on at 9 a.m. on a Saturday for getting <laughs> up. Because um, we do have quite a few from uh, from North America here. That's Yay, happy, happy Saturday, everyone. Um, okay, very nice. Alrighty, so Oh, and we have more and more people logging in. Great. Now, at least I know Sean is in Berlin. So we have a few more Europeans who just joined. Uh, so that's nice. Um, we're currently experimenting. Okay, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of a, of a, of a broad intro, given the fact that we, we do have a few people that are, uh, that are new to those meetings. So uh, the Foresight Sanity Preserver is a salon that uh, I launched now um, yeah, about a week ago. Um, kind of to, to do three things. First, to create a community for people that are isolating across the world. Um, and That's the one to too. On topics of <laughs> yes, uh, Kriam, we can hear you <laughs> if you want to mute yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Um, then second of all, um, we would really love to kind of like service projects that are currently in need of support. And there's still a lot of projects out there. And uh, we will probably be announcing something quite exciting in terms of donation matching uh, for mask and PPE projects on Monday. Um, so if you want to get involved in that, um, that would be great. And then thirdly, um, that we want to kind of like use this as an opportunity to kind of like connect on um, how do we want to push for the future uh, that so many of us can see that currently seems a little bit further away, um, like a really ambitious, positive, um, kind of like human-centered future. But um, 
that even though it may seem uh, quite far away, right now may actually be the time to push for it because right now we're in a crisis situation. In a crisis situation, ideas that previously sounded crazy are suddenly on the table. Um, so we want to kind of surface those ideas and kind of like and be a little bit bold and ambitious. Um, and yeah, I think I've seen it before. I used as let's not waste a good crisis. Um, you know, I think in in that spirit, um, uh, you know, we we we, de we definitely while while doing the things that are important right now, I think thinking about the next step um, now is a good time if uh, if if ever. Okay, great. Another person that I'm admitting. With that being said, I will share a little bit more info on how to join those salons in the chat um, and how to stay up to date because we now have uh, all of the uh, videos on our website already. So it's quite exciting for the folks that want to um, kind of like catch up on the videos that were produced. We produced a lot of videos, almost as much content in the last uh, two weeks as we usually produce over uh, a year. So that's that's kind of exciting. And um, let's see if we can keep up the good quality. I am not worried about that today. Uh, today we have a really fantastic speaker. I'm really, really, really grateful to you, Anastasia, who is also on the call. First, Anastasia, to have met you and to have collaborated with you. Um, she's a fantastic person that I, I'm hoping to be able uh, to uh, lure a little bit further into the Bay Area. And currently uh, she is, I think, with us still in the Bay Area, if I'm correct. Uh, Anastasia, yes, or yes. Have thank you, you, thank you, Alison. No, I'm still here. Yes, happily so. But oh, great. Okay, but it's mutual. I'm glad. So I'm hoping, <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping we'll have you for much longer. And Anastasia is really um, kind of like a treasure trove of ideas. We collaborated with her on a few uh, longevity uh, projects before. Hopefully, a few more in the pipeline. And um, recently, she has started collaborating with Dr. Ronja Nag and. Uh, I think, you know, Ronda, when I first uh, saw your bio, I was like uh, quite flabbergasted because uh, I think you take a, a pretty um, holistic and comprehensive approach uh, to AI, which uh, I think is, is something that, um, that this community could wildly benefit uh, from. So I'm uh, incredibly stoked uh, for your talk. Um, uh, you'll be speaking on artificial intelligence, human-centered AI and beyond, in a nutshell, the boundaries uh, of our humanity. Um, you are an inventor and entrepreneur and a Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute Interdisciplinary Fellow. Um, you all have also um, really uh, kind of like pushed for a few uh, pretty actionable technology uh, projects and I'll share a little bit more about those in the chat so people can read up on your bio. Uh, for now, I wanna uh, give the stage up to you. Um, I would say that I'm going to collect questions um, for now in the chat and then I'll unmute you if you wanna ask a question and, um, and we can see if we can make this a quite uh, kind of like back and forth and two-way conversation this morning that would be quite nice um yeah okay with that being said i'm incredibly thrilled to have you uh, on board thank you so much for joining um uh, in your in a very beautiful setting there with a bay bridge <laughs> behind you <laughs> yesterday we had june yoon with uh, with, uh, with a burning man behind him let's see if that's going to happen but for now we have you here i'm really thrilled uh, happy saturday uh, and welcome i can't wait for your talk Okay, thank you, Alison. Thank you very much for everybody being here at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. Uh, so, and that, thank you for that incredible introduction, Alison. Uh, I'm, I'm very flattered. Uh, so uh, as Alison said, yes, the chat window, feel free to put questions in the chat in the window, not just to me, but to, amongst yourselves as well. That's fine too. I, won't, I, I kind of find it fun to sort of, uh, uh, I've, I've done these kinds of things before and people just chat amongst themselves as well. And that's sometimes interesting. So I'm going to put up my uh, slides, and we'll get through till. Um, uh, let's see. Let's have a look. Share, and uh, let's see. There we go. Right. That's so got the slides up. People can see that. Great. Yes. Okay. Right. Let's see. So. Uh, so yes. So uh, I'm a fellow at Stanford, but I'm also a founder of R42, which Anastasia works for. And what is R42? So we're a fund and we're an institute. Um, so we, we sort of write first checks into uh, seed stage companies, usually deep science. Uh, we also have a quant fund, an equities fund. We have about 50 positions. You can go to the uh, r42group.com site. We also have an institute. Uh, just not quite like the Foresight Institute, and not as much fun as the Foresight Institute, uh, but we uh, 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 give uh, classes at various um, 
uh, uh, bodies, the Institute of Engineering and Technology in the UK, uh, over at Stanford, also Corpora, and we also help small companies. Uh, the Stanford class, those of you who are interested, if you like this, uh, starts on April 16th. Um, this is deep learning, human-centered AI and beyond. And what I try and do is take complex topics and try to explain it in simple language. Uh, but more than a hand wavy uh, talk, we try and go a little bit deeper. So I, the prereq for this one was, uh, was uh, ninth grade uh, algebra, but no more than that. So uh, it should be accessible for everybody else. Uh, there's another one, uh, which is the longevity series, which is mainly not me. It's uh, interesting speakers uh, in the longevity area, Aubrey de Grey um, and Professor Snyder from Stanford, David Brown, he invented Viagra, and uh, uh, he's in Cambridge, and then Lorna Harris, she's in Exeter University, to talk about some cutting edge uh, ideas. But also my bit, again, trying to give an overview and explain in simple language, because I'm actually a simple person uh, to, uh, in, in, um, in simple language, uh, complex topics. So why is it 42? Uh, so I think this fits with uh, what the Foresight Institute is. Those of you, some of you, many of you, I'm sure have heard of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, which is a book by Douglas Adams. And unfortunately, Douglas uh, Adams passed away last year. Um, but 42, it's a kind of a science fiction satire. And it's trying to find the answer to life, universe and everything, the ultimate question of life, universe and everything, finding the answer. And there's a computer called the Earth and it calculates for 7.5 million years and they find out the answer and the answer is 42. Uh, unfortunately, they figured out uh, that they, they actually don't know what the question is. And so they now have to run it for another 10 million years to figure out what the question is. So that's what R42 is, R for Ron John and 42. Uh, I'm always looking for, for um, uh, for answers to lots of things and quite often I meet with lots of small companies and have great solutions But sometimes we have a solution. We haven't figured out what the solution is for where it can be used uh, So it means I can work on anything and everything uh, So again, feel free to uh, put stuff in the chat. I'm not looking at the chat window So Alison you can sort of pipe up if you want to uh, if you think there's an interesting question to answer uh, So who am I? Uh, I think Alison gave me a great great introduction um, I'm, uh, uh, I've been in the um, Bay Area for about 30 years. I actually live in Palo Alto, despite the Golden Gate Bridge uh, view there, which is about, uh, uh, about 25 miles south of San Francisco. And my background is in mobile and artificial intelligence. And uh, my specialism is uh, starting companies and selling them to uh, the most successful mobile phone companies in each time horizon. Uh, so I started off with speech recognition, handwriting recognition company, sold it to Motorola. And um, then we invented the first mobile app store in 1999, sold it to Blackberry, and then uh, more recently, Vocal IQ, uh, which is a speech recognition dialogue company, that's more the advisor there, sold it to Apple. I worked with about 50 companies. And uh, I'm at Stanford uh, as well. And I, what I'm going to talk about today is the Boundaries of Humanity project, uh, which is in the center for the study of language and information. Um, so I've, yes, I've worked on, invented lots of things. And where I get my inspiration from is not just from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but also Star Trek. And in Star Trek, we have lots of um, uh, embodiments of what could happen when you meld machines and humans. And we'll talk about this talk. Well, what, what are the, what's actually possible and what are the actual implications? And I know we've got a very wide audience. Some of you are probably more expert than I am in certain specialisms. Uh, others may be more, uh, more of a general uh, viewpoint. So I'm going to be, again, keep it fairly, fairly um, simple, but try and double click a, a little bit as well into each topic. Uh, so what we'll cover this morning is what I call is the boundaries of humanity. So what is intelligence and how does it differ in humans, animals and machines? Uh, we'll touch upon consciousness as well. Um, this holy grail, you know, can you actually have a self-aware 
artificial intelligence entity. And then finally, we'll talk about the sort of potential societal changes. And I think, as Alison said, uh, you know, there's some things that, uh, uh, because we're all locked up, uh, m might give rise to uh, more serious attention to certain ideas than, than before. So the boundaries of humanity, this is a question, this project uh, we're looking at at Stanford is, you know, what is it to be, what is it to be human? What, what does it mean to be human? Not just from a, 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 a biological point of view, but are there cultural aspects that actually relate to being to, to humanity? And do animals have those same aspects or are, are, are we different? And then if we, if we can actually identify them, if we can actually describe them, can we actually implement them in machines? And if we were able to put them in machines, how would we change ourselves? So there's certain things in, in humans where we have emotions and we have morals. And uh, there's a question in, in academia is, you know, are we special or are we just a different kind of animal, right? Are we just, just a normal animal? And uh, uh, what, uh, uh, and we just happen to be lucky and we got born with sort of hands that we can manipulate, uh, which gives us an acceleration uh, power. Yes, go ahead and put uh, questions and uh, comments in the chat. Um, and then if we were able to make things, put things in machines, um, you know, could we, could we actually, um, uh, could we actually uh, think of life differently? Um, and this is not just uh, the man-machine part, it's also biotechnology. If we start to, um, start to do gene editing, uh, if we start to do looking at uh, uh, changing the way humans are at a biochemical level or a biogenetic level or animals, uh, what, what are the ethics that actually we, we have to consider? So what does it, what distinct, let's start about, what we'll start, start, what distinguishes humans from machines? Um, and often people sort of say, well, we've got hands and other people don't, or we've got language and other, other things don't. Uh, as you start to double click in so many of these things, you find that many of these things are not as unique as you might think. Um, but if you take a lot of these things together, there's more, more differentiation. Um, just a quick, because we'll refer to this later on, just a quick definition of uh, a strong AI and weak AI. Most of the things we see out in, in the world, in, in machines, is what we consider as weak AI. And the reason for that is because the technical definition of artificial intelligence is uh, human-like performance. And so as a result, when we, when we listen to Siri or we see our robot vacuum cleaner, uh, most of those things are technically not AI. Uh, having said that, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Everybody refers to AI, machine learning, predictive analytics, or whatever. They use them interchangeably. And um, as uh, Wittgenstein said, well, eventually uh, the definition of words uh, end up being the way they're used, not the, not the, uh, the way they're originally defined. And so we're seeing this uh, the terminology of AI. But we've come to strong AI. This talk is how do we get strong AI? Um, let me have a quick look at the uh, uh, chat window. Yes, it's a. Uh, uh, let me just bring that up as well. It's, uh, so I can just keep monitoring it. Um, okay. Right. So first of all, we've, in, so we've talked about AI intelligence, but what is intelligence? Uh, one key thing that we have as humans is cultural intelligence, um, which is uh, intelligence that we get from other humans, uh, other generations, uh, ancestors, rules that we write, rituals, religion. Um, and so one of the key things that, um, that, that, that intelligence is passed on in humans is that intelligence is passed on not just by uh, uh, genetics, our brain power, but also 
uh, culture. And the technologies that we use are uh, a sort of shared culturally rather than genetically. Um, so when we store and transmit information, uh, this is a key thing, and Bill uh, uh, Durham at Stanford in the anthropology department has written that this is a cultural advantage uh, for the human species. So we're very skilled at social transmission. Now, do animals have this? Uh, and um, some have argued that uh, this is unique to humans, um, but others say actually uh, apes and chimpanzees, chimpanzees uh, have these as well. Uh, we're more warlike than many animals, not all animal species. Uh, as, we start, as, as we start to look at um, uh, other animals for language, uh, we can actually look at whales and dolphins. There's a law called Zipf's law that says uh, the frequency of sounds is uh, halves for the most frequent word and the next frequent word. And you can see this in whales and dolphins. They see the same characteristic. Um, they also have uh, uh, transfer skills and hunting skills and play. Um, and pigeons, for example, can uh, pass roots, preferred roots, uh, from generation to generation. So in machines, it's very different. You know, we store it in, 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 a, in a digital form. Uh, maybe uh, anecdotally, it could be Amazon reviews. We have newspapers. These are all now in, in stored digitally, uh, either actually in uh, uh, a binary form or even if it's on paper, we're storing it on a material. Um, as we start to look at um, higher order elements of culture, uh, we have uh, uh, morals start to come in. And sometimes these morals you know, conflict with the uh, objective function of, uh, of actual survival. Sometimes you will do something that is not to your, your actual uh, personal benefit, but for the benefit of society. Not moving. Oh, there we go. Uh, embodied cognition, right? There is so, one, uh, one, sorry, if I may interrupt, one comment by Diego is symbolic processing is one. Um, yes. He can explain in the symbolic species that, that, that he's, that's one that he was just flagging. Yeah, so Terry Deacon, uh, yeah, the symbolic species. So uh, this goes a little bit to the history of um, artificial intelligence somewhat. And this, I think he means it uh, a little bit differently to the AI meaning. Um, but uh, symbolic processing was the traditional way. Um, if we go back to history in 1940s, 50s, people were looking at the neurons uh, to, uh, no, to, to see how intelligence could, could be uh, incorporated in the neuro neuron model. And then people said, well, no, how do we actually get uh, information in a symbolic format and actually be able to um, uh, uh, actually encode those in a machine? And that lasted for about 20, 30 years or so. Uh, and then the last 20 years or so, it's like, so, well, actually, uh, we, it's too difficult to define the symbols. Let's try and collect the statistics. Uh, now, actually, we're trying to see more recently, really uh, trying to get hybrid models of these two so symbols and, uh, and neuronal models. Um, but intelligence is not just in the brain. Uh, there's the robot called Kismet um, at MIT, but by, by Rodney Books, about 20 years ago, actually, uh, which said, well, look, you know, if we don't actually have a physical embodiment, um, then you actually won't actually ever get to uh, the uh, uh, real intelligence that we all know on this call. Um, and that is, you know, so you need an actual body, you need an actual uh, 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 connection to a physical system. Uh, and this is inseparable to emotions and it's inseparable to interactions with other entities around us. Uh, so uh, one, one more, there's one more question, uh, if, I, if I may just chime in from David Grossov. I think, David, you had a few. I'm going to unmute you if you want to. Uh, I've got to continue uh, on the chat. Oh, so I know David. Hello, David. So, Hello. 
Let me uh, start the video. So it's basically, I, I'm, I'm uh, as they say nowadays, it's problematic uh, to say that there's culture in machines. I mean, we have human cultural artifacts and information stored in machines. We used to have it stored on a cave wall. Um, aren't you just sort of playing with words here? Uh, <laughs> when, when, I mean, by, by, uh, to sharpen the question, what would it be to have a piece of machine culture stored in humans? I, I, I just don't see that culture is a term appropriate to describe machines, even interesting swarms and collectives. So this goes back to uh, sort of, you know, what is culture? What is, uh, what is intelligence? What is culture? And um, rather uh, uh, cynically, some people might say, well, these things are quite difficult to define, uh, but you know it when you see it. So, you know, David, you're, I think you're correct. You say, well, what I'm seeing now is not, not culture, quote, quote, unquote. Uh, but could I get part of this talk? So could, could it? Act, what what do we need to actually uh, put it happen? Make make it happen in in terms of you know, can machines? Um, uh, uh, and this is not just machines. We're also talking about animals, right? And uh, I think one of the theses is we have culture as humans, um, and animals don't have it. They just sort of act in. You know, they don't have transmission from generation to generation to generation. And machines certainly don't have it. That's the current current model. Um, the question is, could you ever have it? And as, as I said, gave a couple of examples on the animals, the, the pigeons. Uh, maybe it's not completely true uh, in uh, uh, clearly, clearly transmitting uh, pigeon routes uh, may not be considered in our, by human standards, a very deep level of culture, but maybe uh, if you're a pigeon, it, it probably is. I'll sort of move on a bit. And uh, we'll get back to some, uh, some, some questions. Um, so how does the brain learn? And, um, uh, and, and can we have better learning algorithms? So there's this concept of unsupervised learning and supervised learning. So unsupervised learning is where we just, we don't have any labeled data. We just, we just have data thrown at us, but we don't know what the data means. Um, supervised learning is where we have labeled data. We say, oh, uh, either our mother or our, our machine is presented, uh, uh, mother presents or a machine presents a uh, handwritten character and says, this is an A, this is a B, this is a C, and we're supervised. So when we're born, you could argue that most of our learning is unsupervised. We have some, some things that we can recognize as maybe pre-programmed, pre but in general, it's unsupervised. And then as we get to uh, toddler age, uh, maybe it's a mix of supervised and un unsupervised together. Uh, but do humans learn from millions of examples of data? Most of the deep learning systems, uh, which I'm not going to go through in, in this uh, talk, um, train in hundreds of thousands or millions of examples of data, um, many of which are labeled, sometimes unlabeled. And yet as a human, we can, uh, recognize I've even, even over the video if I saw Alison in, in the street tomorrow I could probably recognize her and say hello just from a few few images and so how will we actually get what we call strong AI this because of most of the things that we see now are, is weak AI how will we actually get strong AI, which is closer to human-like systems and that's in a multi-dimensional level there's in pure performance but also levels where many computer scientists are not really even looking at. You know, emotion, morals, um, envy, love, guilt. Uh, how would we actually uh, do that, and enter that as a calculation? I see a lot of questions. We have another question from Go ahead, hey, Diego over yes. there. And I think, uh, let me see, where is it? It's been Diego, I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, be aware and unmute it. Here you are. So, uh, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, my, my question was, oh, someone else wrote in the chat here. Uh, does it have um, any relation to an agent or process actually supervising the process? Or is this just a generic label, an umbrella term for whether things have labels or conceptual closeness or conceptual attractors? Like, I'm, I'm not really sure what a supervised learning is. Yeah, supervised learning is 
you can think of it as we're presented labeled data. So each data element, whatever you're trying to learn, um, you'll present, so it could be, say, it could be, this is a happy face, this is a sad face. And so somebody would go around and say, okay, let's collect faces and this, this person's happy, this person's happy, this person's happy. Or even the poll that Alison did at the beginning. Right. How do you, how do you feel? And, and you'd, you'd have either your brain as a human, you learn it as a human, you say, oh, well, this, over time you realize, oh, this person's sad or puzzled or angry. Um, uh, uh, but but the label your question is, I understand your question. I think, you know, what's creating that person to be at? Is there an agent behind that that's creating that? And can you model the agent instead? Uh, can you model the mechanism? And that's where you can actually get, um, uh, and this is a great debate in uh, stock market prediction algorithms, for example. If you use past data, often it doesn't work on the real stock market. And so can you actually create a model instead which doesn't use data, but it just has a model, it's a formula. So the laws of gravity, for example, we have a law, we don't actually have to collect, we don't have to drop a ball 10,000 times uh, to learn the laws of gravity. We know the law ahead of time, we actually know it. Um, and so you have a model, this, so you can argue there's an agent around there that's, uh, that's actually um, uh, defining the interaction. Um, See you for you. So also, if you ask answer ask questions in the chat, if you think you know the answer to somebody else's question, I mean, some people are doing that. Uh, feel free to pipe up. Um, I'll uh, I'll move on. Uh, we've got quite a lot to get through. Uh, so one of the um, concepts is that we know we have the biggest brains. Well, we actually don't have the biggest brains, uh, and that's one of the we're the biggest brains, and that's why we're cleverer. Uh, we actually don't have the biggest brains, not in actual weight, but we do have the uh, biggest uh, cerebral cortex, and the, we have the highest density uh, of neurons in the cerebral cortex. This is the part of the brain that's at the, at the, at the, that handles uh, language and understanding and self-awareness. Um, it turns out size isn't that relevant, and... Um, there you go, Creon's giving you, I'm learning something already, bigger, bigger cause, but it's, it's, size isn't that relevant, but density is. Um, and so the, the elephant has uh, 251 billion uh, neurons, um, but less uh, in their cortex than, uh, than we do. Uh, so the brain for, is, is actually, um, very efficient relative to machines. Uh, we use about um, 20 watts, 20 to 50 watts um, in uh, power compared to say, for example, the uh, Google system that plays AlphaGo and um, which use about 20 different processes, probably 20 kilowatts rather than 20 watts. Um, but yet, as a percentage of our total metabolism, is still quite high. Um, and we have you know, about uh, 100 billion neurons. We have a, a fair chunk that dies every day. We have, but we, our 100 billion neurons are quite robust. Uh, even if you have a brain disease, we can still do a lot of things. We can still uh, breathe and eat. Um, uh, and um, people are looking at the system, the algorithms that we use in machines, uh, do they actually have those same algorithms in our, um, in, our um, uh, in, in, in our brain? And there's been a lot of debate on that. And, and the, the way that uh, uh, neural networks are modeled, which I'm not gonna get into here, is it's a model of neurons connecting to other neurons. And uh, people, uh, can update the connections mathematically and do our mathematical algorithms relate to the way that uh, they appear in, uh, in, in, in the actual biological brain. And typically people have not found direct relationships, but uh, certainly my advisor from 30 years ago, David Rummerhart, thought, well, just because you can't see it directly doesn't mean it's not happening indirectly. Um, and so 
we have just like um, many machines have internal diagnostics, we have internal diagnostics uh, that overrides uh, any signals that we, uh, uh, we try and do. For example, you, you'll have difficulty killing yourself by holding your breath uh, because you'll just pass out and start breathing again. Um, but you can starve yourself. Uh, and um, it's, uh, you know, animals are different in this aspect. They don't usually go on diets voluntarily. Um, and uh, we've got to sort of compare sort of engineering fault tolerance versus human fault tolerance. And uh, as we start to get into machines uh, with um, uh, embedded into humans, um, this is Kevin Warwick from Coventry University in the UK. And uh, for about, about 30 years or so, um, they, um, he's been putting things inside his body. Uh, I can remember about 30 years ago, he put a little sensor inside his arm. Uh, now he's putting uh, metal tips inside his fingers. Uh, so you can sort of touch, you know, complete circuits when he touches things. Um, uh, this is Professor Hugh Ho, who unfortunately had a very tragic accident while climbing. Um, but the, uh, but he wears these very intelligent prostheses uh, and give very interesting talks. Um, and so we're starting to get, uh, you know, this melding of humans and, and, and bodies. Uh, this is also some work that's done at uh, various universities at Stanford and at Brown. Uh, where you've got the, uh, a sensor, uh, the, 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 an array of a hundred uh, uh, um, sensors, that a uh, hundred little needles that detect electrical signals. Um, and uh, the person has been able to actually move a mouse just by thinking. So can a machine have a mind? Um, what do we mean by a mind and what levels of, uh, of, of strong AI-ness uh, can we have in a mind? Can we be conscious? Can we be self-aware? Um, and you know, we can sort of simulate intelligence, uh, you know, solve specific problems, uh, some types of speech recognition, some types of handwriting recognition. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the usual, um, uh, trope that's uh, that's that's uh, sent out is that of HAL, uh, HAL 2001, a space odyssey, which was a computer that was self-aware and was uh, uh, possessed the knowledge that's superior to a human, and he took over the spaceship. This is a movie about 50 years ago, and uh, interesting enough, the same movie's got iPads and many things, and there's things like lip reading uh, and, and, and and the like, and so. Could you ever get there? Um, and uh, could you actually have consciousness? And there's probably a, many, many uh, disciplines that philosophers have looked at this. So the computer scientists are looking at, looking at this. Uh, uh, neuroscience are looking at it. Know, where is consciousness in the brain? And what is it? Uh, the definition of it is very, very difficult. Uh, so one school of thought, one way that we're having difficulty defining it is it's, uh, it's actually a fundamental concept, it's like time and space. And that's one way, one, one school of thought. Another school of thought is, you know, we're just a channel for consciousness rather than an embodiment for consciousness. Um, or we actually are, we do actually have correlates in the brain. There are parts of the brain that people have looked at and say, okay, this is what the consciousness means. That's what's, what's there. And, um, uh, uh, but it's not really equivalent to consciousness. And this goes back to where it's actually, maybe it's just an illusion. It's just the side effect. Uh, there's no such thing as real consciousness. And there's nothing really more to thinking than just the, the, the cogs and the chemicals in our brain. Uh, and the argument whether you could actually put a, uh, a mind into a machine is, um, Professor Searle at Berkeley puts forward the Chinese room experiment, which says, let's imagine you've got a room and you put a person in the room and this person is given Chinese characters, uh, essays written in Chinese characters, and his only job is to rewrite the essays 
uh, copy the characters and hand it over to somebody else outside the room. And uh, Searle says, well, if this person just does it, does, is he actually thinking? Um, this is all the computer's doing. And so therefore, uh, is he, actually, he doesn't actually know what the instructions are or what they're actually doing. And so it's actually not computable. Um, interestingly enough, I actually was this person in uh, about 28 years ago when Motorola bought my company. Uh, the first thing they told me to do is please invent Chinese handwriting recognition. And of course, I don't, didn't, didn't speak, still don't speak, read or write Chinese. Um, but using mathematics, uh, we figured out a system to make it work. We hired a, a, a number of people who do understand Chinese. But it turns out even I picked up a little bit of Chinese as well. Uh, so can you think, um, right, so we can program to play chess, but is that really Sorry, thinking? I have one question. Uh, Go ahead. Could you yes. maybe uh, can they, uh, talk about zero shot translation, uh, you know, and how, how that may, uh, you know, relate to Searle's uh, uh, argument? Yeah, so uh, just to explain that zero shot, one, tra one shot is basically, uh, can, you, can you learn without actually having any data or uh, one shot, no, one, one, one part of, um, uh, 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 from, from looking at only a, a single example, can you learn from that? Um, certainly the way we program computers right now is we don't, uh, the, the latest topic, hot topic in the last 10 years or so is deep learning and it does completely the opposite. We need, we need lots and lots of data and uh, we, uh, uh, to, to compute the parameters and the theory is we can't possibly know the mechanism uh, for anything. Uh, but I think, as I said before, uh, if you can actually do know the mechanism, uh, and this could be pre-programmed biologically for certain things, uh, that you actually do know, light, it could be simply light and dark, um, then um, uh, going forward, I'm more optimistic, we're going to come back to more of a hybrid system. It's clearly, as a brain, clearly we, we, we can do things without lots and lots of data. Um, and so um, it, it, it's, uh, it, so, so we've been trying to say that the, the brain, the human brain is the sole existence proof of real deep intelligence, strong, uh, strong AI in, in, in the actual definition system. Um, why don't we just keep looking at the brain and figure out how the brain works and, and, and do, do that? There's many things that we know uh, to do, and this is the example I usually give, long division, um, or even calculus, differentiating calculus, we teach, we teach my 15, 16 year old calculus, um, does he actually know why it works? Uh, he just follows the recipe of how to, how to do it, and even grown-ups, uh, uh, if you ask people how to, you know, why does long di division work, uh, very few people actually know why it works, and, uh, and, and so uh, many people are not actually thinking, they're just following the recipe themselves. Um, so we'll talk about uh, quantum mind theory of consciousness. Uh, this is Roger Penrose, it's not as popular these days, um, but he suggests that consciousness is part of the um, forces of the particles uh, in uh, the molecular level, creating uh, forces as they reach particular energy levels. And, um, it's kind of my, my the way to I, the way to think of it. Maybe it's, maybe it's like love at first sight. You know, you 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 actually not you haven't said anything, but there's some kind of energy force somehow that uh, that the uh, that the other person's brain is picking up. Um, and the critique here is quantum mechanics is even more difficult to understand than uh, than than consciousness. So uh, does it actually simplify the uh, the, um, uh, the the answer? Uh, Francis Crick, Christoph Koch, uh, Francis Crick passed away, unfortunately, some time ago. Um, he started looking in the last uh, part of his life at uh, consciousness. Uh, Christoph Koch is at the um, Paul Allen Institute in Seattle. And uh, he put forth the idea, again, we said before, you know, it resides in the sort of the, uh, uh, the brain's prefrontal cor cortex. And so Crick said, well, let's find out where it is. Um, and uh, he wrote this book, The Cer Scientific Search for the Soul. And um, 
I think many people in um, uh, in uh, of a sort of uh, in religion said, "Great, finally the scientists are looking at you know what religion is and what is the soul." Finally, they find the soul, and they were hoping that this was going to be the uh, a solution to this and in fact most of it was actually the, almost the opposite um and said well your 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 free will your identity is no more than a behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules i'll go for a few more minutes and then we'll sort of open up for discussion uh, because there's lots of intelligence in this room itself in this uh, video call um it's um uh, let's go uh, so can we build a machines uh, with, with consciousness itself, right? Um, so uh, Stanislas Dehaene in, in Paris, uh, tried to pin it down. He says there's, there's, there's really three types of subconsciousness. He sort of makes this equal to kind of the deep mind alpha go or face recognition things. We, we kind of like do it, but we're not sure how we do, do it. Uh, then there's sort of consciousness part one, uh, which is uh, a way where, which is part of the brain where we retain a lot of thoughts at the same time. And it's sort of like a, a dispatch system. We figure out which parts of, the, of these um, regions are you need to be used at, uh, at, at the right time. And then consciousness two, uh, which is um, figuring out like, what's us and what's outside. And uh, in the closest thing to that, in the computer science literature is this path net system, which is sort of like a, a giant neural network that's trying to choose other bits of neural networks to uh, um, choose which bits of neural networks to choose for certain tasks. So let me, I think uh, we've got 14 minutes or so because there's lots of questions and also comments. Um, why don't we open it up for, Alison, do we sort of open up the, um, Opening up for people to yeah. comment, maybe maybe a comment yeah. or ask questions either way. Say, Have a discussion. Yeah, either way, I would say um, if you'd like, uh, raise your hand or uh, ask in the group chat, and then I'll cue you. Okay, we have a uh, Creon. Uh, I will unmute you. Okay, Creon, ask away, and then raise your hands or uh, ask in the group chat, and I'll cue you after Creon. Uh, okay, Ranjan, do you meditate? Uh, I I. I uh, that's what I do a lot of things, and um, I think I get the equivalent of meditation when I go my 19 mile runs. Well, that's interesting. Uh, perhaps you do, but if you haven't actually studied it, I suspect that you may really not be doing meditation in the sense that uh, scholars and, and teachers of meditation are talking about. I mean, um, let's just say that there's a very, there's a huge, uh, field of uh, study, it's called study that's, that's in that realm. And that's like saying kind of like, well, when I go running, I kind of do quantum mechanics. It's like, well, yeah, you might think so, but if you haven't studied it, probably not. Um, so anyway, the reason that I ask this is because, uh, you know, I've been interested in AI and all this stuff for a long time, not uh, as a professional like you, but you know, as a, as a scientist. And in fact, back in the eighties, I read Rommel Hart uh, yep. Ramalhaj books and all this kind of stuff. I've been into it through several winters uh, and may stay, stay into it through the next winter. Um, but uh, here's the thing. Um, it was only when I started meditating that I, that I think I got some real insight into a consciousness, which you cannot get by studying neuroscience and computer science, okay? Because what meditation actually is, to a large extent, is using the the mind and particularly the attention focused, the part of the mind that, that has a, that is attention. Okay. Which is normally attending either to various intrusions from the outside world or is attending to ruminating and like just, just dream, daydreaming and fantasizing. And what you do with meditation is you turn the attention focused part of the mind, which is really the part that, you know, quote unquote, makes us human and allows us to plan and observe and uh, to a greater extent than other animals, you turn that attention seeking part onto itself, okay? And that's when you start to actually learn about the nature of mind and the nature of consciousness. Because, because unfortunately you can't really use science because you can't do repeatable objective experiments that others can 
verify. You really have to, the only way to look at them, well, one of the only ways to look at the mind is to use the mind. And yeah. it, it turns out, and I'm almost done here, and it turns out that really works. And, you're, and what you learn is that consciousness is not what you think or what almost anyone thinks who doesn't meditate. Um, it's much more, but not exactly, like the epiphenomenon situation. And basically, the last thing I'll say, and this is not me at all, this is like anybody who teaches meditation. meditation. What you learn, for instance, is you are not the author of your own thoughts. You have no more control over what you are thinking than you have over what you are hearing. It just shows up, and then your consciousness notices it. But it's not like there's an author of the thoughts that is you. The, the consciousness and the thing which is uh, generating the thoughts are really quite different subsystems. Good comments. Uh, Alison, why don't you find the next person to comment while I answer that uh, as well? Uh, yes, we uh, have two people lined up. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so I think this is an age old question. It's not just consciousness. It's, this, is, this is like everything. Should we study the, the brain is the only existence proof? And you're saying, as, as I think there is an argument for that, the only existence proofs of consciousness is us ourselves. Should we study that to figure it out? Um, the, the, the usual, the, the opposing view is uh, uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright got a lot further when they stopped studying birds and started looking at, at the uh, laws of fluid mechanics instead in trying to make planes fly. I think there are arguments on both sides, um, but uh, uh, and so I'll just leave it there. Next question, Alison. All right, uh, Ify Sun, I just unmuted you. Well, comment. It doesn't mean it has to be a question. It's be a comment. <laughs> Both <laughs> work. Let's see. Wait. Is he still um, there? Yeah. Okay. Here you go. Oh, it's a really intelligent discussion so far. And uh, so I was giving a talk to a group of like a 200 teachers and uh, administrators in, from China, in Chinese, of course. And, so I was talking about a human thing. Let me, let me, uh, sorry. There was a, <laughs> sorry, there is a phone call, come on, you know, there's somebody. Yeah, we're here. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, it's nonsense, I, will, uh, I cannot do that. No, 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 don't. We can also, sorry. Uh, you oh, and then this is a different here. phone. Okay, that's a different phone. I got too many devices in front of me. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I was giving a talk to a group of teachers, uh, basically they're middle school and high school teachers, administrators, talking about what we can learn from the current situation, how to be a real human being. So I talk about different aspects, be a real human being. So we start with, uh, the, I have three triangles. The start with the first triangle is about basic uh, skills, knowledge, how to survive the environment, make a living. And then we talk about how to know the people, the society, how to get a culture sense, moral value things. So that's the two basic. I think animals do have those fundamental stuff in terms of the skills, how to survive, right. in terms of how to take care of the fellows, families, they have values. So we, we are made, human beings may have higher level of intelligence in that aspect, but one thing is missing from all the animals, I think, is about the wisdom. Wisdom is something, we think something, we saw some, we see something, we can think about something else. We can make the connection immediately without thinking or consciousness is something called unconsciously. Realize something you never realized before, right at that spot. So it's a philosophical, beyond the scientific, the culture, we elevate to the philosophical level, I call it wisdom. So I think ultimately it's philosophy. Philosophical thinking is the ultimate difference between human beings and animals. Right. That's, I'm just trying so to I just want to know your comments on that. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, I mean, I think um, some uh, first impression I think when we, we always think, well, humans can do this, who can do, has this and everything. Um, I'm just trying to think, is there a counter example? Because we thought about these other things uh, in my, in a few slides back. I said, well, obviously humans are 
uh, uh, you know, we, we, we're the only ones that do war. Well, it turns out there are some other you know, ants do war. And, uh, 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 and so everything you think that was unique to us, um, and I don't know the answer, whether the, the, the specific way I can come out off the top of my head, uh, uh, an animal that has this wisdom uh, concept. Uh, and this is what goes back to my first slide. If you take just one thing by itself, you might be able to find a counterexample. Well, I don't know what the counterexample is yet. <laughs> but if you take lots of things together, then it's very difficult. Um, that's, that's, I think that's my response. So I'm not, it, 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 that's, I think that's my response there. So, uh, I have uh, one, one question there because it, uh, it reminds me really much, um, quite uh, prominently of the um, discussion of the Jack Ma and Elon Musk. I don't know if you, if you saw that where uh, I think Elon Musk was uh, you know, pushing for um, uh, you know, kind of uh, a concern with, uh, with er early arrival of artificial general intelligence and Jack Ma made the same comment uh, that, that you also made. So I think it's also, I think, um, you know, perhaps like an interesting uh, difference between uh, perhaps like a more Asian uh, uh, or like holistic understanding of intelligence and one that is uh, perhaps uh, a bit more centered in the West. And I would love to see if you could comment on that or, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong there. And uh, and you know where where it may fall fall out. Like, do we just need more compute, or is there anything else? Well, my professor at uh, at Cambridge, this is forty years ago. This is a very common question, computer scientists. If I had more memory, more compute, more this, won't won't we just get us? Won't we get us? What's the problem, right? Uh, and he said, Well, no, I think we'll just get the same wrong answer back quicker, right? With more compute. And so the because fundamentally we haven't got these. Um, you know, both what Creon said uh, and Yen Fi said, uh, uh, so we haven't had, I don't think we've actually got the models yet, right, for whether you call it wisdom or whether you call it consciousness, we haven't actually got them yet. And it goes back to, you know, can we actually do it by studying the brain itself or is that a fool's errand? Because it's not actually there, you know, it's just an artifact uh, from that, that's created. There's no actual. Uh, a component there inside the brain. I think the wisdom part where we can translate from one topic to another topic, maybe there, maybe there's some uh, mappings that can be, can be, can be done there uh, as well. Um, I, I, um, is there, is there one fundamental reason why you think that uh, more compute and just doing the things that we're doing right now won't get us to AGI? Like where do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, do, I think it's. Uh, I don't think it would get us there um, because it goes back to the fundamental example that even animals or even babies can do things uh, that just from from looking at something once. And the current deep learning system, they, even though I'm a fan, I've worked on it thirty years, just like Creon. You know, I've read the PDP books and all these things. Um, uh, it's got to be more, it'll be more subtle, more more of a hybrid system. Um, and there are some work in there using uh, these Bayesian systems, which uh, have uh, you know work on less data, or where we need maybe in the mechanisms of things. And goes again the laws of gravity, the laws of thermodynamics. We don't need lots of data for that we, because we understand some of the mechanisms of these uh, uh, of, of these uh, processes. And so if we. I think it's going to need more of a hybrid and just having more compute and more data is clearly not the way we do it. So I think if you, the answer to your question then, Alison, okay, it's not the way we do it, but could we do it in a different way, right? Uh, can, can machines get to where we are differently? This is the Orville and Wilbur Wright system, right? They stopped looking at birds flying and yeah. they did it completely in a different way. And they actually flew faster than birds in the end and further than birds. Uh, 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 in the end. And so... Um, well, no, that's not true. The Wright brothers never flew further than, than long distance migrating birds, not even within a factor of a thousand, I don't think. They, you know, clearly I, I they, mean, mig migrating birds can go from pole to pole. It's, uh, it's, uh, they probably have to, pole to pole, do they stop for some energy? Well, planes could do that too. Planes, the modern planes can do that too. <laughs> they can refuel on the way. They don't have to stop. <laughs> um, I mean, there are there are a lot of uh, I think really good AI approaches out there. One that is 
kind of like both likely uh, um, both likely and perhaps save as comprehensive AI services by Eric Drexler, for example, which I think you know got much of the field to update uh, and and kind of like have, have this more um, kind of like uh, almost like market based uh, approach to computation and and which which is a little bit more distributed. So I think you know there there are a few I think uh, quite creative uh, approaches and I think people are updating a lot in the field. Yeah, yeah, I think it's distributed. Uh, I, th I think it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, the, the question is, is it, are we going to do it incrementally? Uh, we should be simply on that part. Or is there some kind of revolutionary component, a revolutionary idea that uh, will actually uh, set us on a completely different path? Or is it like, you know, deep learning, the analogy I usually give is like, um, you know, a, uh, uh, electric car versus a combustion engine. The electric car goes faster uh, and it's uh, quieter, uh, but a uh, regular combustion engine, your regular car has been, it's had so many tweaks for a hundred years. You know, a luxury Mercedes gas powered car um, is quite comfortable, quite smooth, quite quiet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's difficult to beat, it, took, you know, it, took, it might take decades to beat a, uh, maybe what's fundamentally an inferior technology, but if you have enough tweaks on it, um, uh, they, sometimes it's very, very difficult to uh, as, as circumvent. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, I think uh, we are now at, um, at 10, 10 or one. Um, I think Anderson? if anyone wants to sneak in. Yes. Anderson, can I make a few more comments? Who is this? Uh, has anyone, uh, is, would anyone like to make a comment who has not make, made a comment yet? Okay, Yife, you have the last Okay, make a few more comments. <laughs> okay, more comments. Okay. <laughs> well, when I was talking to the group of teachers, I say not everybody has wisdom. Wisdom only belongs to those super smart people. Not every teacher has a wisdom, not every human being has to. Actually, we as human beings, some have no difference from animals, even worse than animals, from what I observed during the current situation dealing with the coronavirus, the situation. So that's my final comments. Okay, that's very kind. That's very, very kind, very good summary. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Alison, um, thank you uh, for... Um, uh, for, 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 for inviting me, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the comments have been very, very interesting. Um, let's see if I can get my email address or whatever people want to. Um, I don't think sort of, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a. Somewhere. Somewhere right at the beginning. There we go. There you go. I'll put uh, yeah, or Ron John at stanford.edu works as well. And yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would love to, uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, either share the slides uh, yes. and, and or your, uh, your website uh, in the show notes uh, on the schedule so that that's usually where we where also link to the videos um, and some people can follow up basically on all the talks uh, and kind of like uh, and can follow up on the on the information. I thank you very much for joining and um, I think we def definitely traversed some crazy territory um, and we did like a a kind of crazy walkthrough um, and and really barely scratched the surface on uh, on on most of them. So thank you so much for um kind of like um leading us through this uh, through this Edison, adventure land. Can I have a final um, question? <laughs> no, sorry. Just <laughs> one, sorry. one sentence. No, we're out. <laughs> we're sorry, out. we're out. This is Stanford. Where you mean? Where you mean? Where you mean? Where you mean? It's very nice that you're so engaged, but uh, I think we we will leave this for another time. For now, I really, really thank you, Ron John. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, mm -hmm. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., uh, I'll be leading uh, the Foresight Hive Mind here, which is basically uh, where I want to hear from you guys because uh, we are currently cooking something up uh, that is, um, let's say, related to um, pushing for ambitious long-term change uh, based uh, on COVID-19. And that's probably coming up very, very soon. So we would, I would love to get your feedback. I would love to know what you think about that idea. Uh, and you know we can maybe like do some brainstorming tomorrow morning. So if you're interested in collaborating on that, uh, I invite you all to join uh, tomorrow morning's discussion. It will be quite informal. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to uh, cogitate with you. For now, thank you so much, Rondon, for joining. It's really been a pleasure. 
Um, I'm hoping to hear much more of you in the future. Thank you, Anastasia, for making it happen. And I hope you all have uh, a lovely, a lovely Saturday. For now, I'm going to uh, share uh, just in the chat, if you guys want to copy this, um, a few ways in which to join the future uh, salons. There's the schedule that has everything you need to know. And uh, there's the Zoom link on which we always meet. Uh, you can apply to host the salon and you should add the um, salons to your Google calendars. You don't miss uh, out on them, especially uh, to keep the time zones uh, in check. Uh, and you can watch all the videos on our website. So if you want to copy paste them now, because I will be closing the meeting in just a minute. Thank you so much, Ron John. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a lovely Saturday.